Good morning, and welcome to St. Genevieve, and welcome to the uh, St. Genevieve History Conference. Uh, a couple of things before we start. My name is uh, Skip Weiler, and I'm with the Foundation for Restoration of St. Genevieve. Uh, we are the sponsor for this event, and uh, we love sponsoring this event. This is a, this is a great event, and uh, I've been coming to it for a few years, not as long as I should have, but... Uh, and I, I really love it because every year I take something away from it um, that I didn't know. And so it, that, you know, it's something that uh, I look forward to. Our first speaker is Mark W. Kelly. He's a retired United States Department of Agricultural Natural Resources uh, Conservation Service archaeologist uh, he told me last night that he is an attorney and an archaeologist who has documented numerous sites of import to those Native American tribes formerly residing on or within the Missouri River watershed in the 19th century. Kelly has, as well, surveyed and documented multiple sites associated with the early day adventurers, immigrants, and the westward advance of the United States Army in multiple states. Kelly is a licensed Oklahoma attorney with a particular interest in the development of federal Indian law, treaty construction, Indian removal, and the ignoble process of assimilation. He has written numerous articles for publication and has been an invited speaker at conferences and symposia focusing on the upper Missouri fur trade, early day federal expeditions up the Missouri, and aspects of the so-called Indian problem of the 19th century. Kelly has published two books, including Lost Voices on the Missouri, John Doherty, and the Indian Frontier, uh, this was in 2013, and Annie's Story, and The Extraordinary Life of Annie Doherty Ruff, and that was in 2015. He most recently appeared in the television documentary program, Into the Wild Frontier, program on Andrew Henry, fur trapper, explorer, and one-time resident of St. Genevieve. Please welcome Mark W. Kelly, who will present Andrew Henry versus Marie Vallée, the first legislator derived divorce in the territory of Louisiana. <laughs> It is my pleasure to be here. I want to thank Bob Mueller for inviting me. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pure enjoyment. I love this town. I've been here many times in the past uh, for reasons that were related to the John Doherty story, Pierre Bernard, and, and people like that. But, uh, Andrew Henry is, I just finished his biography. It's gone to the publisher. It should be out next year. Uh, as a resident here, of of uh, St. Genevieve, uh, as they call it now. Uh, but hardly anybody here knows who Andrew Henry is. But if you go out west, you definitely know who Andrew Henry is. You've got Henry's Fork of the Snake River. You've got Henry's Fork of the Green River. He's the guy who established the first uh, trading post across the Continental Divide. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been an enjoyment over the years. I have found these locations. I have found the Henry's Fork Camp, Henry's campsite, uh, multiple uh, associated uh, uh, places in that story, you know, so the early days, fur trade era. But uh, this story today is one that I discovered. It's, uh, uh, it's a bit different. It's a bit different. It might be a little too early in the morning for, uh, for some of the for a story like this, but it's a good story. Pardon me. Yes, I'm an attorney, but the, there's, when you have depositions, I need to read those and not uh, and not just pontificate. Let me let me do what I can do, and hopefully it'll be enjoyable for you. But uh, so this is this is to my to to the best of my knowledge, this is the first divorce that uh, occurred in what would become the state of Missouri. Uh, and it uh, so there's no precedent. It's why it was such a an elongated affair. It was well over two years time to get this divorce. So the circumstances that required this divorce, we're gonna, we're gonna hear this story. Okay. 
so we've got a few images, and uh, it's not PowerPoint, my, my uh, fault for that, but I'm just, uh, I'm just, I didn't have that name, so Bob's going to advance the, advance the photo. This is, as you all know, the Green Tree Tavern. Andrew Henry was a mason. Uh, he was a master mason, and there is a, a record of them having to cross the Mississippi River to Kaskaskia, where the, where the first lodge was of these guys. And then they petitioned, and the Pennsylvania gave them the right to open this, uh, this lodge in uh, San Juan de uh, But that's a, that's a great picture. And of course, the building's still there. And now, to my, I did not know that the National Park Service had taken it over. So, so, uh, so I'm assuming that's still open for viewing. But, uh, but anyway, uh, Andrew Henry, 20 years of age or less, late of York County, Pennsylvania, arrived unheralded in Colonial saint jean via Nashville, Tennessee, in April 1800. So we're, we're talking a few years ago. saint jean at the time of Henry's arrival, possessed a population of eight, uh, 806 individuals, uh, excluding slaves, certainly representative of a more, more rust, but robust uh, mercantile uh, settlement than that possessed by Nashville at the time with only 206 residents. San jean however, unlike Nashville, was firmly fixed at the time of Henry's arrival under the sovereignty of Spain, as it had been since the 1763 Treaty of Paris, being situated on the right bank of the Mississippi. Uh, uh, detachment of the Royal Spanish Army was yet uh, stationed at San jean commanded, however, by the aristocratic Frenchman Louis de Bride de Villa, who had assumed command of the post on June 15, 1770. The inhabitants of San jean were a closely knit group of French Canadian families, unquestionably headed by Francois Valli II at the time of Henry's arrival. Commandant Villa had married Marie Louise Valli, Valli, daughter of Francois Valli I in 1771, an event that no doubt augmented the import of the Valli family in San jean that Andrew Henry energetically sought to grow his economic profile, I'm not gonna go into that, but he did so, must be acknowledged, but he was not inclined to forego matrimonial bliss in so doing. Henry most assuredly would not ignore an opportunity to acquire a primary interest in the property possessed by an esteemed, if not the preeminent family of San Javier, the Valley family. Henry, of course, was quite aware of the Catum de Paris, as practiced in San Javier, which practice hardened, harkened back to the uh, famous five, matrimonial property law of North Central France. Indeed, the marriage contract was vitally important, being the chief instrument for transmitting family wealth in that era. Marriage contracts in San Javier were commonly drafted in the presence of multiple witnesses, which contract provided for the pooling of wealth to essentially form or extend the economic reach of the merged families. Henry, no doubt, was also quite aware of the fact that, in accordance with the Catum de Paris, wives retained the right to renounce the marriage contract and <coughs> withdraw their share of the cognate of goods and property. Regardless, Andrew Henry made his marital intentions known to Miss Marie Villa, the orphan daughter of Spanish Commandant Louis de Bray de Villa and his wife Marie Louise Valley. The marriage of 15-year-old Marie Vila to 25-year-old Henry was performed by the parish priest and vicarie general of Louisiana Territory, James Maxwell, on December 16, 1805, despite December being described as the least popular month for marriages. <laughs> uh, the original document, uh, thanks to Bob, he found this for me, his house in the Church of San jean parish records, record of mixed marriages on from 1796 to 1812. Uh, and the various document as it reads, uh, we can uh, advance uh, the next and see what we've got here. Okay, this is uh, the, the academy that's here. Andrew Henry was a member of the, uh, of the board that uh, uh, sought the funds and, and completed the construction of that. We'll just, we'll just catch up and, and uh, 
and this is the house that Andrew Henry, uh, uh, per the records today, uh, he is, he is uh, identified as the owner from 1805. Uh, actually in 1805, this property is owned by Amos Roark. It's about 11 miles south of here, south, south, east, southwest. And, uh, but this, this property was owned by Andrew Henry in this time period. Uh, is that in St. Genevieve County? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's pretty close to Bennett's Landing. And the individual who owns that house is here today, Brandon Crawford. Uh, the interior at, uh, of, that, of that particular house. And this one is, this is the original record of uh, that uh, Austin Jean uh, uh, Smith, the guy who, uh, who used to be the, the past individual of the Kaskaskia Lodge, he found this for me, and this is the, uh, the original record of Edgar Henry being raised to Master Mason in 1806. And I think we're about to get to the marriage document. <laughs> Maybe. No, we're going to see the church first. But we'll see the church. First. Yeah, and of course this is this is the way it looked then. It does not look like that today. But I'll just make one little slight correction. This was an 1837 church. So okay, so, so Andrew was, Henry it was the wood church. Okay, the wood church. But uh, that's still a nice photograph. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, the marriage document. And it reads: In the year of our Lord God, 1805, the 16th of December. Having dispensed with three publications of bands for good and laudable reasons of the future marriage between Andrew Henry, son of George Henry and Marguerite Young, native of New York, or of York County, state of Pennsylvania, as he said, on the one part, and Mary Vila, daughter of Louis de Bry Vila, formerly an officer in the Louisiana Regiment, and Marie Louis Louise Valley, native of Appalachia, on the other part, having discovered no hindrance to their marriage. I have received their mutual consent and have married them according to the established regulations of this province with regard to persons who are not of the same persuasion and point of religion. So uh, a goodly number of Henry's friends attended the ceremony but to fulfill the requirement of multiple si uh, signatures necessary for the Catoon de Paris. The signatures would even appear, appear in two columns underlying this text. The right column underneath the uh, the signature of A. Henry and Marie Vila. You've got George Bullock. Anybody know that name? Okay. Uh, Brother Mason of Henry. Dr. Walter Finley. People know. Okay. Also Brother Mason of Henry and joint owner of the Mind Renault. Uh, Francois Valley III, cousin of Marie Vila and Brother Mason of Henry as well. I've had people say, you're kidding. A Frenchman in the, in the Masonic Lodge? You're kidding. It happened. Uh, uh, Brother Mason of Henry and Charles Vila, uh, ostensibly, I don't know who he is, the guardian of Marie Vila and the Vila estate. The left column provides Jean Baptiste Valley, the present commandant of Saint Jean de Arc, and brother to the deceased mother of Marie Vila, uh, Marie Louis Valley Vila, and supposedly I think she was struck by lightning. And then Charles Smith, husband to the sister of Marie, Caroline, also William H. Ashley, if you know that name, and the fur trade Brown, who would become the first lieutenant governor of Missouri. Joseph Pratt, John H. Weaver, another big name in the fur trade out west, business associate with Henry and Brother Mason, and last, Maxwell, priest. Anyway, despite the no doubt warm congratulatory Congratulatory wishes for a shared life of everlasting joy and happiness, such would not transpire. <laughs> Indeed, Andrew Henry determined it necessary to part company with his wife, Marie Vila Henry, within days of the ceremony. <laughs> the following account is rather remarkable, albeit convoluted, presenting an observation of the early 19th century tenets, customs, and conventions of the community of saint jean in the territory of Louisiana. As the story unfolds, are you guys ready? <laughs> Marie Vila Henry, on her wedding night, was obliged to confess to her husband, Andrew Henry, that she had previously, previously been debauched. What that means is her moral purity destroyed. <laughs> By her brother-in-law, John Price. Do you know that name? <laughs> husband of Marie's sister, Ufrazi. Henry thereafter, upon hearing his wife's confession, determined a divorce must be obtained. 
In that era, however, Henry could only obtain a legal separation. Indeed, the judicial apparatus to obtain anything else did not exist, nor would it exist for nearly two years. As the story unfolds, Marie Villa Henry, uh, in due time, uh, let me say, in due time, the legislative judicial arms of the United States territorial government were fully staffed, and then Andrew Henry obtained the services of William C. Carr, a saint jean attorney lately arrived from San Luis, San Louis. Uh, Carr had been charged by Henry to forward his plea to the territorial legislature of Louisiana to, to seek the construction of an act whereby the general court of the territory of Louisiana could be tasked with prosecuting the dissolution of his marriage to Marie Vila. William C. Carr forwarded the petition of Andrew Henry to the territorial legislature, then in session of San Luis, San Luis, St. Louis, which petition, upon being read to and considered by the collective body of delegates, was duly acknowledged as worthy of prosecution. Can you imagine having to go through that today to get into the courts? Thus, on Independence Day, of course, little occurred. July 4, 1807, 18 months after the separation of Henry from Marie Villa, Henry, an act for the relief of Andrew Henry was constructed and passed, which act was stipulated to be in force on the passage. This act possessed six sections. Section one, be it enacted by the legislature of the territory of Louisiana, that the said Andrew Henry may and shall be permitted to apply to any one of the judges of the general court within this territory, whose duty it shall be to issue a writ comprising the material facts suggested in the petition of Andrew Henry, said Andrew Henry, which writ shall require the defendant, Marie Villa Henry, walk to the said Andrew Henry to appear before the judges of the said general court on the first day, this October term, next. Section two, on the return day of the said writ, if the said Marie shall fail to appear either in person or by counsel, the court shall cause in, this word was obscured, I don't know what it is, but it, it means particular, uh, evidentiary disclosure to be made of the facts suggested in the writ, and if the jury or the court, which is interesting, uh, as the case may be, shall find that the facts in their mutual parts are true, the said court shall thereupon pronounce a judgment of dissolution of the marriage contract existing between the said parties and they shall from thenceforth be deemed and held as completely separated from each other, and the bonds of their marriage shall be dissolved and canceled to every intent and purpose. Section three address the possibility that uh, this case could be extended past October should Marie Vila Henry determine not to, or uh, to, to, to decide to stay there. And it would be a more convoluted mess after that. Uh, section four, either party may within 10 days after the service of the court obtain from the clerk of the said general court a debtorness, a debtorness being a writ, and this particular writ to commission a private person to depose individuals in place of the judge, but a justice of the peace, to take the deposition of all witnesses residing at a greater distance than 50 miles from San Luis, St. Louis. And here, as I can tell in that era by the, by the old road, San Jean Villa was at least 63 miles away from San Louis. Section five, the, uh, the said court on the determination of this case shall be authorized to make such order as to the cost of this suit as they may deem just, and I do not know, it's not a matter of record, what the costs were. Section six, final section, it shall be the duty of the clerk of the legislature to furnish to Andrew Henry or his agent or application a certified copy of the petition referred to in this act. William C. Carr, as attorney of record for Andrew Henry, we had his portrait there, did indeed obtain a certified copy of the pe petition referred to in this act as evidenced by his signature attached there to affirming the foregoing is hereby declared to be a law of the territory of Louisiana to take effect and be enforced from and after the passage thereof. So he's basically just restating what the, what the, what the act forwarded. But being thus armed with a certified copy of the July 4th, 1807, an act for the relief of Andrew Henry, thereby possessing the endorsement of the territorial legislature, William C. Carr immediately sought and obtained an audience with Judge Otto Schrader. Do you know that man? Spot does. He presided here in San Jean Uh of the St. 
Job of South Jumbo District of the Territory of Louisiana, as so stipulated in Section 1 of the Act. Thereafter, on July 16, 1807, having reviewed and considered the documentation, Judge Schrader signed and sealed the following document, the town of San Jacques, addressed to the General Court of San Luis, San Luis, in the Territory of Louisiana, wherein he delineated the peculiarities of Henry's predicament requiring action by the court. Whereas Andrew Henry presented his petition first to the worshipful legislature for the Territory of Louisiana now sitting, respectfully des desiring that he may be released from the chains of matrimony between him and Marie and his wife, and having been advised that the laws now in force in the territory do not embrace the peculiarity of his situation, is urged to make the following statement of his, of his case to your honorable body, confidently relying that your wisdom and justice will measure out to him that relief which the necessity of his case will be found to merit at your hand. Your petitioner begs me respectfully to represent in this tyrant to represent to your honorable body that he flatters himself. He is as deeply impressed with the sense of the nature of marriage contracts and of their sanctity with which they ought to be preserved by all governments as the grand end of the institution. But as he believes that there does exist in every government some power that can and all supersede or destroy the common and ordinary contracts between man and man, woman, for certain cause, so he does also hope that in this case, if the cause shall be found, that you will grant him relief, whereby the facts herein stated, it cannot be, but be manifest, how he could be regretted, that he has been cruelly deceived and effectively cut off from all prospect of attaining the great and important ends of his marriage contract with his said wife. As to specificity regarding the facts herein stated, as Schroeder stated, necessitating the attainment of divorce via legislative enactment and trial by the General Court of the Territory of Louisiana, Judge Otto Schrader further provided as follows, that Andrew Henry being lawfully married to a certain Marie Vila, not doubting but that she was perfectly chaste and free from ever having committed the crimes of fornication or adultery, but immediately after his marriage, your petitioner, having certain reasons to suspect the chastity of her, the said Marie Vila, previous to their marriage, charged her with having injured and deceived him, and of having had criminal connection with some man or men before her marriage. This she, the said Marie Vila, then and there immediately and voluntarily confessed to be true, and acknowledged that she had been debauched by a certain John Price, who was then and is still married to her sister, who prizes, that she had frequently committed the crime of adultery with the above named John Price. Judge Otto Schrader thereafter, after he described the peculiarity of Andrew Henry's predicament, that there was not at that time a legal precedent to provide for the absolute dissolution of a marriage in the territory of Louisiana. As he wrote, understanding at that time, December of 1805, that there was no laws passed since the American government took possession of Louisiana territory regarding divorces, and that the Spanish law then in force on that subject did not permit a divorce in Vitula matrimony, a full or complete divorce, your petitioner, Andrew Henry, proceeded agreeably to procure a separation executed in the presence of a justice of the peace by and with the advice and consent of the Reverend James Maxwell, the individual who performed the, the wedding. Your petitioner ranks here with him before your honorable body and has it ready to be shown the law of Spain in force in this country at the aforesaid change of government the power of divorcing or separation between man and wife was vested in the commandant at that time, John Baptiste Valle, the uncle of Maria Vila Henry, and that this act of separation, as your petitioner is informed, corresponded to a divorce in Mincet Toro, to live apart but married still, under the laws of England. Interestingly, this law in England, British common law, would not be abolished until 1857. So good luck getting the divorce. That's why, in case you ever, ever get noticed in the old time uh, San Luis newspapers, time after time after time, an individual will put an ad, I will not be responsible for the care and well-being of my wife who has departed my house. You couldn't get divorced, some wives just left. There's a story I gotta tell you about the wild woman of the Gascony, perhaps sometime, 
And the woman with her Tawas, or Ottawa Indian, comes into a fur trade camp and doesn't say a word. They give her something to eat. She eats and she gets up and wanders off. Who was she? Where did she come from? But this happened time and time again. Women could not get a divorce. They just left. They just left. Uh, and Otto Schroeder, Schroeder continues. And we're at the such a legislature. Yet on the fourth day of July, 1807, at the town of San Luis, San Luis, in the country of Forsyth, pass an act, an act for the relief of Andrew Henry. Therefore, to command you to summon the above name, Marie Vila Henry, that she be and appear before the judges at the general court to be held at the town of San Luis, San St. Louis, on the first Monday in October next, then and there to answer and send him the said Andrew Henry, the charges in the above petition, set forth, and also to show cause, if any, she can, why the said court should not proceed to decree a divorce. This summons would subsequently be served on Marie Vila Henry by the sheriff Henry Dodge. Is that name? Henry Dodge. Also, a particular note in the documentation signed by Judge Otto Schrader, there was a specific request of the San Luis General Court, which most assuredly derived from Andrew Henry's awareness of the fact that with the departure of Marie Vila Henry from the bonds of matrimony, matrimony, so too departed her considerable wealth for the platoon de Paris. Judge Ray specifically requested the St. Louis General Court that your honorable body would grant your petition of Andrew Henry such further and further relief as his case may be deemed to merit. The granting of such further relief does not appear to occur via the extent granted. The act entitled, An Act for the Relief of Andrew Henry, wherein in section four necessitated the attainment of multiple depositions Apart from that demanded of Marie Vila Henry, as so provided in the August 20th, 1807 writ of Dedimus, issued by Honorable John D.C. Lucas, Esquire, presiding judge of the said court at St. Louis, over the signature and seal of this clerk reads as follows. This is great. I've, I've had to read this to several people. It's just fun being a lawyer and seeing how things were done. We, possessing special trust and confidence in your integrity and circumspection, do command and require you, and I'm named Justice of the Peace, that you cause to come before you all such evidence as shall be named or produced to you in a certain suit now pending in the general court of our territory of Louisiana. Before the judges of the said court, between Andrew Henry Plaintiff and Marie Vila Henry Defendant, on the part of said Andrew Henry, and that you examine them upon their corporal oath to be by you administered on the holy evangelist of Almighty God, touching their knowledge or remembrance of anything that may relate to the courts aforesaid, and having reduced the depositions of the witnesses by you in writing, you send the same with this commission, closed under your hand, and sealed to our said general court with all convenient speed. In pursuance thereof, Francois Valley III, multiple people related to Francois here, whose signature was attached to the wedding certificate, was deposed on August 29, 1807, at the house of one Joshua Penniman. Joshua Penniman, Justice of the Peace of San John Diego, pursuant to Section 4 of the July 4, 1807, an act for the relief of the King, and the writ of deadness, dated August 20, 1807, issued by Judge J.D.C. Lucas. Dali, being of lawful age and sworn, declared under oath as follows that he is well acquainted with the above named plaintiff and defendant, Marie Vila Henry, and that the said defendant previous to her marriage lived with a certain John Price, who was married to her sister, Utrazi, and that she had so lived with her brother-in-law for some considerable time previous thereto, that sometime in the month of December, 1805, the said plaintiff and defendant were married, that on the next day, this deponent understood that an unfortunate difference had taken place between said Henry and wife, and in the evening of the same day, the aforesaid Marie Vila Henry in the absence of the said Andrew Henry, observed to this deponent, Valet, that she was the most unfortunate woman, for that she had most cruelly deceived her husband and rendered him as well as herself wretched and miserable, that the above named John Price was the man who had ruined her and was her seducer, that she had been guilty of submitting to the criminal embraces of said Price previous to her marriage with her innocent husband, and thereby had destroyed their happiness and that she was so sensible of her improper conduct as she then related to this deponent, and thus injuring, unjustly injuring so worthy a man that she considered herself unworthy to live. 
This deponent also states that he saw the said Marie for three or four days afterwards, both at the house of the said Henry, and that her brother-in-law, Camille de Lasso de Luthier, had married Mathilde Villers and Villa, another sister of Marie Villa, at all of which times she appeared greatly distressed and inquired of him, Pali, how her dear Henry was, that she was unworthy of him and had too cruelly deceived him and destroyed his happiness. She, the said Marie, always repenting of having had a criminal connection and committed the crime of fornication with the said John Price, whom she did not cease to execrate as her destroyer, this deponent also states that the said Marie did then and frequently thereafter tell him that the said Henry had never used any force or terror in order to extort from her any confessions of the above nature, but on the contrary, repeatedly declared that it was her own conscience which forced her to confess uh, how much she had deceived so good a man. <coughs> Pardon. That she had deceived him enough and could not reconcile to herself to deceive him any further, that about two or three days after their marriage, they separated and have had, to the best of this deponent's knowledge, no society or connection with each other since the act of separation which took place between them. Last paragraph. That sometime previous to the marriage of said Andrew Henry and Marie Villa, this deponent, Francois Vallée, met her, the said Marie, and the above named John Price together after night in the street. And this deponent, upon inquiring, understood that she was going to her uncle. John Baptiste Valley's to sit up with a sick woman. That this deponent also knows that she, the said Marie, went to her uncle's frequently after night to sit up with the said sick woman, but does not know who conducted her there, but suppose and believe <coughs> it was the said Price, and further saith not. Louis Lafour, also being of lawful age and sworn, was as well deposed in the presence of Joshua Kenneman, Justice of the Peace, on 29 August 1807. Lefour specifically confirmed the statement made by Francois Vallée regarding having met Marie Villa and her escort after nightfall reportedly on their way to the home of her uncle, John Baptiste Vallée, he having accompanied Vallée on that particular evening. Lefour also, on his oath, stated that he had personally served Marie Villa written notice on the 28th of August that depositions would be taken pertaining to Andrew Henry's suit for divorce at the house of Penniman between the hours of 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. The third and last of the depositions <coughs> recorded on August 29th was that of Dr. Walter Finley. I had to go by the house the other day, or just yesterday. Uh, confirmed that Marie Villa had resided in the home of John Price, her brother-in-law, constantly for some considerable time previous to her marriage with Andrew Henry. Finley further stated that some short time after their marriage, this opponent went to the house of said Henry, who appeared to be greatly distressed, and said that he was an unhappy man that his beloved Poupon, meaning his wife, was lost to him forever, that she had confessed and told him she had been debauched previous to her marriage by her brother-in-law, John Price, that she considered <laughs> his happiness effectively destroyed and all of his prospects blasted. Walter Fenwick further stated that a few days after this time, he had caused a visit to the house of Camille Lupierre, where he presently resided Marie de la Henry, following her separation from Andrew Henry. Fenwick thereafter continued, continued, she, Marie Villa, then confessed to this opponent that she had been seduced and debauched by the said John Price previous to her marriage, that she appeared much distressed and carried in her countenance and behavior at that time the fullest conviction of what she had confessed. It is also this opponent's serious impression and belief that what she then revealed was the plain, simple, and undisguised truth. This opponent also knows that the said Marie did in his presence presence make a solemn, ap solemn affidavit containing the confession above detail to which affidavit he was a witness. William C. Carr, having now in his possession the primary documentation being necessary to warrant obligatory remedy by the General Court of San Luis San Luis during that forthcoming October term, a certified copy of an act for the release of Andrew Henry, a signed seal summary of the pertinent facts and forthright recommendation for a divorce and vincula matrimony by the St. Genevieve District Judge Otto Schrader, supported by the sworn depositions of three worthy San jean citizens, proceeded to forward the entirety of the collection to the General Court in St. Louis, as stipulated by the writ of Judge John D. C. Lucas, accompanied by Carr's own succinct summary statement, the petition, Andrew Henry, complains of the said Marie Villa Henry for having committed fornication with a certain John Price 
previous to her marriage with him, the said petitioner, as would appear by own, her own confession, and that in consequence thereof, a voluntary act of separation took place between the parties on the third day of January, 1806, which, since which time there has been no society, commerce, or connection between him and the said Marie. Although no transcript of the, of the St. Louis General Court trial exists, if such transpired, there is included with the next stand file a statement signed by Joseph Couture, Jr., identified as foreman. We, the jury, find the facts stated herein to be true. Thus, as provided in Section 2 of an act for the relief of Andrew Henry of Nova Gloria, the, the jury or the court, as the case may be, shall find the facts in their marital material parts are true. The said court shall thereupon pronounce a judgment of dissolution of the marriage contract existing between the said parties, and they shall from thenceforth be deemed and held as completely separate from each other, and the bonds of their marriage shall be dissolved and canceled for every intent purpose. <coughs> in summation, the declaration of the jury can only indicate that Marie Vila Henry did not contest the divorce. She previously having acknowledged the facts illuminated by the sworn testimony of three individuals known to her via affidavit, it appears following the judicial proceeding that she quietly returned to one of the multiple households of her siblings in San Javier, being of 17 years of age, with her estate intact in accordance with the Coutum de Paris. It further appears that she continued to reside in San Javier for the remainder of her life. I just picture your great side. As to Andre Henry, he was indeed successful in his quest to obtain a divorce in the pool of matrimony, despite the fact that no precedent for such a divorce yet existed in the territory of Louisiana. The divorce of Henry dated October 16, 1807, obtained in excess of 21 months subsequent to the January 3, 1806 date of separation between himself and Marie Lila Henry, appears to be the first recorded in the territory that would become the state of Missouri in 1821. Despite the protract protracted divorce undertaking, Henry appears not to have suffered in the esteem held of him by a saint jean friends and business partners, including members of his former wife's family, as evidenced by subsequent associations with the Valley family men. Further, it may be discerned that Andrew Henry was not given to headstrong rushes of impolitic behavior. As the record indicates, he neither harmed nor otherwise abused Marie Vila, nor did he seek out John Price an erstwhile business associate and future legal adversary to wreak his vengeance on the man. <coughs> Henry, it appears, was determined to rise above and proceed on. A last thought concerning this tumultuous issue, tumultuous issue in the life of Andrew Henry is that with the credible assumption that Francois Valet III was indeed best of friends with Andrew Henry, and as the deposition of Valet provides, that he had been quite suspicious of the behavior of Marie Vila and John Price when met in the street at nightfall prior to Henry's wedding day, one must wonder why Valley did not so inform Henry of her presumed mystery of behavior. It is, of course, highly likely that Valley well understood that Henry would profit handsomely by marrying Marie Vila via the platoon de Paris, and thus perhaps determined that Henry's marriage to an unchaste woman was a matter but little in lieu thereof. If that be the case, Valley must not have been fully acquainted with the character of his friend, Andrew Henry. <coughs> Andrew Henry would again marry, but not until 1818, circa. At 38 years of age, his bride then, 17 year old Mary Fleming, who was born on May 6, 1801, daughter of Patrick Fleming and Marie Louise Monique Thibault. For the record, and I'm almost there, it has been erroneously published by Linda Harper White and Dr. Fred R. Gowns, whom I, I know. Andrew Henry's first marriage to Marie Vila produced a daughter, whom they identified as Mary Henry. This disclosure, however, was derived from an errant reading of the as transcribed August 1st, 1906 interview of Miss Angeline Harris Henry, daughter-in-law of Andrew Henry, conducted by Mary Louise Dalton of the Missouri Historic Society in St. Louis. The pertinent verbiage misconstrued by White and Dr. Gowns is excerpted. Andrew Henry's oldest son was Patrick. He was rather wild. He has, a one, he has one daughter by his first wife, a Miss Mary Henry, a teacher living in Salem, Dean County, by a second wife, Andrew Patrick Henry, living out without Joplin. Indeed, a second declaration by the authors is no less erroneous. 
Family records reveal that his, Andrew Henry's marriage to Mar uh, Mary Putnam was his third marriage. Although the name of the second wife or the date of their marriage is not given, they had a son named Andrew Patrick Henry. In essence, Linda Harper White and Fred Gowans identified Andrew Henry and Marie Villas, uh, Marie Villa Henry as the parents of Miss Mary Henry, when in fact this plan was recorded by Mary Louise Dalton. She was the daughter of Patrick Henry, the son of Andrew Henry, and his first wife. Patrick Henry, upon the death of his first wife, Fence remarried Lion Henry, which <coughs> produced two sons, one of whom was indeed named Andrew Patrick Henry, who was most assuredly not the son of Andrew Henry and his second wife. In short, the family records as referenced by White and Dr. Gowan do not reveal that the marriage of Andrew Henry to Marie Vila produced a daughter, nor do the records reveal that Henry was twice married. Nevertheless, the account is published by White and Gowan has subsequently been referenced and republished by multiple historian authors commenting on the life of Andrew Henry. Perhaps it should be noted that the February 22, 1846 will of Marie Vila makes no reference to a surviving daughter or grandchildren. Indeed, the valet Vila genealogical record indicates Marie Vila never remarried, nor could she as a divorced woman of Catholic faith. As a matter of fact, her will specified that her estate should be divided among the children of her five surviving brothers and sisters. It should be further noted that the marriage of John and Euphrates tried did not produce children of record. Last, perhaps of interest, Marie Vila did not seek to retain the name of Henry, as evidenced by the inscription on her grave monument in the old San Jean Villa Memorial Cemetery, another indication that she did not be married. Thereupon, she is simply identified as Marie Bigger. May she rest. <laughs>